Many reptile keepers suggest leaving all the varium lights turned on for 12 hours each day, the remainder of the time having them fully switched off. To put it simply, this is done because the average day length throughout the year in many parts of the world is approximately 12 hours. Or in other terms, having 12 hour photo periods is an attempt to replicate nature for our animal's benefit. In reality though, daytime and nighttime aren't so distinct from each other as simply turning a set of lights on or off in 12 hour cycles. I mean, you've only got to look out the window to see that day and night do bleed into one another. If we really want to replicate nature, we're going to have to alter the photo periods in our vivaria, which is the blocks of time for which they are lit, such that there are sunrises, sunsets and everything else that you would expect to find out in nature. Now obviously we are going to struggle making things as perfectly continuous as you would expect to find outside, but with a little bit of understanding and effort, we can come a lot closer than just having the whole set of lights go on or off at once. Empirically, we can see that as midday is approached, sunlight appears to get brighter and whiter compared to the warm orange glow of daybreak or evening. So what is going on here and how are we going to replicate it? As the Earth rotates about the axis through its core, the angle of the Sun relative to a fixed point on the surface of the Earth changes. It's incorrect, although easier to visualise, the sun rotating around the Earth. So this is how I'm going to illustrate things for the rest of the video. We can see that as the day progresses towards noon, the depth of atmosphere through which sunlight must travel to reach our fixed point decreases, and this is reversed as we approach night time. Now this is what produces the profound changes in natural light throughout the day that we are used to observing, and I'm now going to tell you how. Electromagnetic radiation is a form of heat energy and can be thought of as consisting of many little units called photons. Different photons have different properties, such as wavelength, which cause them to interact differently with matter in the universe, although all photons are fundamentally similar, being that they are all little packets of heat energy. Now, because the sets of properties taken by photons are continuous, it is convenient to group photons together according to these properties, and it's conventional to refer to wavelength in this regard. So, for example, any photon with a wavelength between 400 and 700 nanometers is considered visible light, and any photon with a wavelength between 280 and 320 nanometers is considered UVB. The Sun emits all kinds of photons into space, and those that reach the Earth's crust are what make up sunlight as you and I know it. Now, to reach the Earth's crust, a photon must, of course, pass through the atmosphere, or in other terms, a photon has to interact with the atmosphere before it can become a part of terrestrial sunlight. Different photons interact differently with the atmosphere according to their properties. The shorter a photon's wavelength, the more its path is diverted by the atmosphere. So whereas long wavelength red and infrared radiation can reach the surface of the Earth almost directly, shorter wavelengths like blue, indigo, violet and ultraviolet are all diffused to an increasing degree by the atmosphere. And in case you're wondering, this is actually why the sky is blue. Following on from this, it makes sense that when the sun is low in the sky, shorter wavelengths are diffused much more greatly than at midday because there is more atmosphere to get through. Conversely, longer wavelengths are present in similar quantities at all times. This explains the redness of dawn and dusk, because red and orange are longer wavelengths, and it also explains why UV indices reach a maximum at the middle of the day, because UV has the shortest wavelengths of all terrestrial sunlight. Now that we understand this, we can see that we can come a step closer to replicating natural day-night cycles if we turn our lamps on and off in an order such that those emitting the longest wavelengths come on the earliest and turn off the latest. Now in practice, this means having your halogen bulbs and other tungsten filament lamps going on first, then your warm white LEDs, then your cool white LEDs, and finally your UV lamps. Towards the end of the day we do things in the opposite order, so UV lamps go off first, then cool white LEDs, then warm white LEDs, and finally your heaters can turn off again. 
The basic idea is to ensure that infrared is available earlier and later than visible light, which in turn must be available earlier and later than UV. In total, you still want the photo period to last about 12 hours. So as an example, you could time your heat lamps to come on at 8 a.m. and go off at 8 p.m., your warm white LEDs to come on at 8.30 and go off at 7.30, your cool white LEDs to come on at 9 o'clock and go off at 7 and finally your UV lamps to come on at 9.30 and go off at 6.30. Of course this is a purely hypothetical example as exactly what you're going to have to do will of course depend on which lamps you've got and the species you are keeping. The best arrangement possible in any case is going to be the one which comes the closest to replicating the changes that a wild counterpart of your reptile would experience out in its own ecological niche in the wild. To come closer to nature, we should even drop the idea of having a rigid 12 hour photo period, as for all species not living at the tropics, the day length will deviate greatly depending on the time of year. So, for example, for the species that you keep, it might be more appropriate to have 14 hour days in the summer and 10 hour days in the winter, but once again what you do will depend on the species concerned. When providing different total day lengths, you should still offer staggered lighting as I've just described. But hold your horses, Joe! What is the point in doing any of this in the first place? Well, if you actually thought about it a bit, I think you'd find that Everybody agrees that trying to replicate nature is the best way of keeping an animal. So even those snaky racky people out there will try and tell you that keeping snakes in racks is the best thing for them because the small dark environment that is a breeding tub is just like the small dark hole that a snake would find itself out in in the wild. Now this is not true, but... The argument that they are following the wild example is still there. So anything that allows us to get one step closer to nature without adding disease and predators has got to be a good thing in my mind. And as a purely cynical side note, if you're going to have your UVB and LEDs on for less than 12 hours a day, it's going to save you money in the long run because they're not going to burn out as soon. So anyway, I hope that you've learned something from this video or at least found it entertaining and you will subscribe so that you don't miss out on any future uploads because I've been JTB Reptiles teaching you how to follow nature's example and I will see you all in the next one. Bye guys!